You are listening to an AI narrated audiobook. If you'd rather read this quick sci fi story, there is a link to the ebook in the video description. Renegade, a new evolution's origins novella by Celine Glode. This is a work of fiction. Copyright 2021 Celine Glode. Chapter 1 Adalia. I sighed as the voice startled me awake. Captain Xiang, please respond, the heavy voice said again. I immediately regretted opting for the integrated communication now implanted in my left temple. Biting down twice to activate the communication implant, I responded. Xiang here. Sir, apologies for the wait. We had a tip of a possible bomber targeting the CS, Titan, and wanted to ensure those threats were squashed prior to you docking at the station. That news made me sit up. Identify yourself, please. Sorry, sir. Wretch Aloy, head of customs and transport here on Vivonu. The Federation was under the impression that your government had handled all guerrilla activity here. I was annoyed now. All Federation officers had a minimum requirement of civic duty that needed to be done. It was a waste of time if you asked me, but here I was on a solo mission bringing food and medical supplies to the Federation's newest potential member. Vivonu was an outlier planet in the Oabile star system. About 20 years ago, two Federation colony ships floundered into this system and found it already inhabited. We had made first contact 250 years after the Great Diaspora. The system was enormous, with 32 other planets, most of them loyal to the Alliance, run by the royal family of Kaelia. Vivonu was only the Federation's second endeavor to enlist an alien planet. Ah! Yes, sir, of course. We have taken care of the insurrectionist, but just wanted to guarantee your and your ship's safety. Recha finally responded, after what I assumed was careful consideration. You are cleared for docking bay 35. Welcome to Vivonu, Captain Xiang. Finally, I said to myself, stretching. The Titan was a small, bare-boned ship with bare metal floors and a cabin that was barely big enough for two people. The cabin had bunk beds in the far left corner and not much else. The rest of the ship consisted of the head, a tiny engineering room, and a relatively large cargo hold. The only good thing about piloting a small cargo ship like the Titan was pretty much everything was able to be done on autopilot. I turned my chair to the nav system to initiate the landing sequence. There on the dash camera, Vivonu calmly rested in the vastness of space. The nav system was much smaller and more straightforward than the usual ships I flew. There was a flashing button with the universal sign for comms, and the entire left side of the dash was a one-stop shop of buttons that started various sequences like landing, powering up, and maneuvers. My goal was to be in and out. Of course, I was happy that the Federation would be growing, but my job was to protect the Federation. I was not a transporter. I would deliver these goods, grab a drink or two at a boozer, and then get back here and crash for the night on the Titan. I was sure that they had some kind of accommodation set up on the surface for me, but the less socializing I had to do, the better. Beginning to feel a bit uneasy as other ships started becoming visible in the docking station, I wondered how honest the Vivanusian government had been about their progress with their rebel groups. I was relieved when the screen on the console popped on again and there was no one gathered outside the cargo bay door. I had heard awful stories of large, welcoming parties being sent to greet travelers like myself when visiting potential joining planets. Shuddering at the thought, I put my hair in a ponytail, grabbed my solar glasses, and headed for the cargo bay. After opening the cargo hatch and stepping on the station, I felt the absolute pull of the planet's gravity. It was a completely different sensation than I was used to since becoming accustomed to the artificial gravity of the ships. I had to grab the hatch quickly to gain my footing, and then it felt just like being back at home. I wondered if anyone was going to show up. These supplies needed to be unloaded, and I hated being on other people's schedules. Checking my surroundings, it looked like any other docking bay, except it was bizarrely vacant. There were a few ships, but there was no reason for me to be assigned to Bay 35 when there were so many open. I slipped on my glasses. I was probably the only person left in the galaxy that decided against the neural net implant, preferring to have my news and other info parcels delivered to a removable option. I scanned the news parcels for any updates about Vivonu, finding nothing new. 
Leaning back against the charcoal metallic hull of the Titan, I looked around and noticed some activity at a small transport ship docked to my right. I watched as the excited passengers laughed and talked. Although I had never been before, I did do enough research on the planet to know what their natives looked like. Vivanusians were humanoids, although their skin and hair were always the same color. From my research, most of the population were blue, purple, pink, or light gold. While their skin looks smooth, it's supposedly very elastic and quite strong. Ah, Captain! My apologies for keeping you waiting! A stout azure man was running towards me, his dark red robes trailing behind him. I instantly recognized his voice and knew it was Recha. No worries, I said, standing. Recha smiled once he finally reached me. He towered over me, which was typical for his people. He reached out his hand. Human custom of the shaking of hands. I apologize for my staring, but I was told to address you as sir, which from my research is traditionally for males of your species, but you are a female human. I shook his hand. Seems your research is outdated, Recha. Apologies, Captain. I can show you your accommodations and we will have the supplies unloaded, do systems checks, and have your ship ready to go. No need, Recha. Just point me to the nearest boozer. Chapter 2. Adalia This day was almost over. I was grateful that there was no official meeting with the government regarding my delivery mission. I assumed they had decided to keep my trip quiet due to the possible threats received earlier. It was no concern of mine, though. I delivered the goods. It was time for a drink, and I would be on my way home to Moreau with my civic duty requirements. For the Federation done for the year. I had to admit once outside the docking station, Aros, the capital, was beautiful. The skyline was sprinkled with towering skyscrapers that reflected the setting sun. The city sat on the edge of the sea, I watched the horizon as the sky was aglow with the last few remaining bright and deep orange rays before the stars arrived. The boozer was exactly where Recha had said, and before I walked in, I discreetly clocked the two gentlemen that had been following me since I had left him. I knew it was a safety measure, so I ignored them and headed straight for the bar. What seemed like hundreds of conversations were being spoken in loud and hushed tones all around me, battling with the bell-centric music dominating the room. A friendly-looking dark blue bartender with spiky matching hair smiled and approached me. I ensured the universal translator was activated on my comm and smiled back. An off-worlder. What can I get you? He seemed to think for a bit and scratched his pointed sky-blue chin. Probably a wet lager, huh? We have it imported for the few off-worlders we get. We are expecting a lot more once we finally join the Eris Federation. An honor it would be. We have been waiting for this for many years. I shook my head. A wet lager just so happened to be my drink of choice. No matter where the Federation sent me, wet lager was there. I heard there was some opposition to your world joining, I said, taking the drink and holding up my left hand to his face. A red dot appeared in his left eye. Just go ahead and start a tab. The red dot flashed again. The Federation was paying, so I might as well enjoy myself. Well, uh, yeah. Mainly on the southern continents, there are many different tribes, and they like things the old way. But that's only a tiny part of the population. Most of us, he leaned in, the civilized ones, are looking forward to the Federation taking us into the future with them. I took a long swill from the copper mug while he observed me. You are with the Federation, right? Your currency chip ran as Federation, but we have a few lowlifes that know how to hack the system and change things like that temporarily. I am, I said energetically, feeling no need to lie. I mean, storm and thunder. I was a Frinxing starship captain in the Erus Federation. I held my title with pride and always kept my 5-8-DT tucked securely in my ankle holster. Ha! I knew it! He said as he slammed his hand on the silver bar. Your credits are no good here. Drinks on the house for the Federation friend. I am Yerud. You are? Adalia Xiang, captain of the battlecruiser New Babylon. Nice to meet you, Yerud. I smiled as he slid me another wet lager. Hey! He yelled to no one in particular, but loud enough for everyone to hear. We have an actual Federation captain in our presence tonight. 
the crowd decided to chime in, hey, and raised their glasses, and I returned the gesture. It was hard not to notice the unimpressed flaxen-colored face in the crowd, a gorgeous and unconcerned golden face that was casually walking up to me. A Federation captain, huh? Her black eyes bore into mine. Ha! These worthless savages! They come into our cities and beg for credits or rations, and now they solicit our Federation guests, a woman shouted. I turned to see her deep violet giant braid slap the gorgeous stranger in the face. Mind your frinksing business! I was talking to the purple-haired human. I watched as a blur of dark plum moved through the air and, without thinking, grabbed the angry Vivanusian's hand before it made contact with that still beautiful golden face. I wasn't sure why I decided to step in. The Federation did not have any power here yet, so I was basically a well-treated civilian at this point. Those two semi-discreet gentlemen following me finally made their debut and cleared the boozer. Great, I thought to myself. What a way to start relations with an alien planet. I gulped down the last of my drink and did a quick scan for the golden Vivonusian, but she was nowhere to be found. The city was just as stunning at night. The two moons reflected off the water, and their light bathed every inch of this seaside city. I slowly made my way back to the docking station, sighing as the salty, briny oceanic air felt cool against my face. It would have to be an early night for me. It had been some years since I was in a brawl in a boozer. However, this didn't count. Do you always cause this much trouble everywhere you go? A voice asked from behind me. I stopped as the owner of the voice caught up to me. The breeze played with her golden hair. She quickly swatted the flyaways out of her face and smiled as she walked beside me. So human, Adalia, was it? You know my name. What is yours? I asked, as those gleaming eyes looked around as if she was expecting someone to jump out from the shadows at any time. Zima? Chapter 3. Zima. The purple-haired human was nice-looking, for a human, of course. Her skin did not match her hair. It was one of the weirdest things about humans that incredibly freaked me out. Like how hard was it to be born with the same colour hair and body? What was I even saying? I was totally distracted. The human ruined the entire operation. Freedom Defence members would be looking for her, but she was innocent. She was defending me. I just had to make sure she made it to her destination and stayed there. She was strolling along like nothing was wrong. So, where are you headed, Adalia? Back to the docking station. Back to my ship. Frinks. She is not staying in lodging. Well, this could be good. They would not know where to find her. Can I see your ship? I instantly regretted the question, and she looked at me suspiciously. I know, I know. I must sound like some kind of Federation groupie or something. But I like to consider myself a freelance engineer. Spacecrafts intrigue me. She seemed unconvinced, but nodded and kept walking, her hair whisking in the wind. The truth is, I hated the Federation. They were a nuisance and were after my home for resources. I glanced up at the graceful moons that shone like white gold and inhaled salty sea air. I could not even think of what Aros or Vivonu would be like after the Federation was done with it. The ship is nothing much. It's a small cargo ship, actually. Nothing that merits a tour, Adalia said her chuckle pulling me from my thoughts. I was unsure how long she had been talking, so I laughed back and hoped for the best. No worries. Is it an alien aircraft, you know? Very crumbly. Adalia smoothed her hair and shook her head. Yeah, I guess it is alien to you, huh? Very crumbly indeed. She stopped walking briefly and looked at me. Do you always go on long walks at night with strangers? No, not usually, but here we are. I had been to Uva docking station a few times, but preferred to stay out of super-populated areas. 
it was completely dead at this time of night. Adalia greeted the bucklers on guard. Fortunately for me, they were very young and very new. We took the lift to the berthing level, and I began feeling more at ease that she would be safe for the night. Adalia and I walked in silence, with only the sounds of metal clanking with her every footfall. I looked down at her heavy-duty boots, probably some G-boots for zero-G situations. Here we are, Adalia said, using both of her hands like she was proudly presenting the most unsightly and smallest ship to me. I told you it wasn't much, just an ordinary old cargo ship. It's hideous! Adalia laughed and shook her head, agreeing. It is. It's nothing compared to what I'm used to flying, she said, opening the hatch to what I assumed would be the cargo area. It was empty and I followed her in. She crouched and sighed as she thudded on the metal floor before pushing her glasses from on top of her head onto her face. Shrugging, I joined her. Well. What do you usually fly, Captain Adalia Xiang of the Federation? Nice memory, she said, impressed. I'm a starship captain. The ships I fly are ten times larger than this. She looked around, unimpressed at the bare metal room. Possibly twenty times. Like the ones we see on the news feeds sometimes, I'm sure. The news is very censored here but there has been a steady rotation of Federation news lately. Possibly, she said before her deep-set brown eyes got very serious, and she freed her hair, which now looked more pink than purple, from its messy ponytail. So, Zima, what is that you want? Oh, Frinks. Want? I do not want anything. I just wanted to check out your ship is all. It's getting late, and I should probably let you get to your lodging and get some rest anyways. I stood and quickly turned to exit the ramp, but Adalia was there in seconds. I checked you out on my HUD. She tapped her glasses. Not much of a file, so I'm assuming you're into some shifty dealings and such. I did see the word smuggler quite often. She dramatically looked around the hold. A mark that turned out to be a bust, huh? What? I'm not a smuggler, first of all. I do happen to know a few people that may smuggle things every now and then. I've never even been off-world. This was not going the way I planned. Why did I even follow her past the entrance? I should have just made sure she made it to the station and went home. I was thankful you stood up for me in the boozer, and wanted to return the favour. Instant regret. It was pretty often I kicked myself for saying things I should not. By now, Adalia was utterly suspicious. Returning the favour? How? Is someone after me? Is that what you are saying? I'm not sure. I paced to the back of the cargo hold. I just wanted to make sure. It was the truth. The Freedom Defenders might have been looking for her after she caused the boozer to be cleared out. Zima, I'm a trained Special Forces Captain in the Federation. Pretty sure I could handle myself. I'm not quite sure what you would do. I rolled my eyes. At first I thought it was a bit charming. But no, you're very arrogant. Must be a Federation thing. Obviously, I didn't mean it that way. I'm sure you are. Very capable. I just meant I could defend myself. Look, this undoubtedly was a mistake. Thank you again for today. It was kind of you to help a stranger. I really do have to go. I stood there waiting for her to move to the side. Instead, she walked up to me so close that our noses were almost touching. I genuinely hope that's what this was all about, because if you are trying to set me up, you will regret it. 
those intense chocolate eyes peered into mine before she backed away and held out her hand for me to pass. Time for me to go. I did not know what I was thinking dealing with the Federation, but I had to make sure she was safe. After I had cleared the ramp, I turned to see her standing at the cargo hold opening, watching me. I did not mean any harm, but meeting you, Captain Adalia Xiang of the Federation, was a pleasure. Chapter 4 Adalia After a pretty sleepless night in my catastrophically uncomfortable bunk, I was more than ready to be cleared to depart off-world. Things hadn't ended on the greatest note with Zima. I had accused her of being a smuggler and maybe threatened her just a tad. I was ready to go home. My wishes were crushed when a nameless voice informed me there would be customs checks on all crafts at the station. My request to speak to Raisha had been acknowledged but was basically blown off. I was starting to wonder if the Federation's higher-ups knew what was happening here on this planet. After I made use of the public facilities on the third floor, I wandered around and took in the full scope of the Uva docking station. When I had arrived, there hadn't been a lot of traffic, but today was the opposite. I discovered there were lodging, food booths, restaurants, and a marketplace on the lower floors. I made my way through the masses, looking for local cuisine. It happened very quickly, but there was nothing I could do to hide my surprise and fury. There was Zima, but she wasn't alone. She was walking intently and deep in conversation with a human. There weren't many humans on Vivanu. In fact, I hadn't seen any since I had been here. But that wasn't the issue. I immediately recognized the man. Delpho Yunus. Wanted by the Federation on a host of charges, but mainly for smuggling. The term pirate was a better name for what he was, but the Federation liked to avoid that word. There were talks that he had been involved in some resistance groups aligned against Federation interests but he had disappeared months ago. Zima had denied being a smuggler, but here she was with Delpho. His almost black shoulder-length hair gently hung over a deceptively friendly face. Bright gray eyes darted impatiently back and forth as he and Zima maneuvered their way through the crowd. They were both dressed in some kind of gray standard coveralls, probably to blend in. Zima was rolling a crate behind her. It wasn't large enough to draw attention, but she hadn't been off-world. Why was she coming through the station with luggage? Not a smuggler, huh? I whispered under my breath. After I casually made my way out of the line and kept them in my view, I stayed far enough behind them not to be noticeable and hoped I didn't lose them. Zima, as intriguing as she was, was in the company of a wanted man. I had no problem turning them both in. I could not bring this to my command without proof, though. Just my suspicion was not enough. As they exited the station, I prayed to the imaginary gods of my parents that they didn't hop in an auto-transport. I did not have the time to argue with the machine because I wasn't sure where I was going and could only order it to follow that other transport. I stealthily followed them in the opposite direction of the boozer I had visited when I first met Zima. Aros was just as stunning during the day, and the sky-high, sleek buildings twinkled in the sunlight as if they were covered in glitter. The streets were pristine, not a speck of trash in sight, and ground and sky transports whizzed by every few seconds in the bustling city. After a few minutes of walking and countless stares from the locals, I watched as Zima and Delpho entered a huge, closed-up building that looked like it might have been some type of warehouse or storage in its prime. I hastily decided the back entrance would be my best bet and proceeded to the rear of the building. When I got to the door, I checked my surroundings before I removed my 5.8 DT. I had no plans to use my weapon, but who knows what I was about to walk into. I was expecting to have to force the door open somehow, or hack a coded keypad, but it wasn't even locked. Worst criminals ever, I muttered to myself as I walked through the door. I was in what seemed to be a poorly lit, extremely messy storage room. There were boxes and crates all over scattered as if they were tossed in here like an afterthought. I flipped up one of the crates to get a closer look and saw that it was leftover Federation supplies. Up ahead, there was an archway with light coming through it. I could also hear faint conversations that were growing louder with each step I took toward the opening. As soon as I turned the corner, my jaw dropped, and I lowered my weapon, 
my head instinctively turned as I heard an infant crying. Here in this warehouse were hundreds of Vivanusians huddled in clusters. Some looked sick and were being attended to, but others just looked worn down and hungry. Distracted, I hadn't even noticed the plasma rifle being pointed at me. Drop your weapon, a grating voice commanded me. I slowly put my hands in the air, attempting to de-escalate the situation and show them I was not a threat. The owner of the rifle stepped closer. I said, drop your Frinksing weapon, Federation scum. No need for name-calling. I will place it on the ground, I said, slowly squatting down, never taking my eyes off him. His salmon-colored finger was itching to hit the trigger. I only agreed to lower my weapon because of the number of civilians. I could not and would not let innocent people be hurt because of me. Captain, a sweet, familiar voice said, What are you doing here? Zima walked up behind the happy trigger finger guy and put her hand on his shoulder. Relax. I know her. You know her? How? he asked. I glanced around, and his companions had lowered their weapons as well but they all had the same confused look on their faces, trying to figure out how Zima knew me. Chapter 5 Zima I could not believe Adalia was here. How did she even find this place? Although she had completely annoyed me the night before, I could not help but smile at her being here. That was until reality set in. How do you know her, Z? Hecane asked again ready to aim his plasma rifle in the captain's face again. This is the human from the boozer, the one who frinked up the entire op and caused us to lose the weapons cache in their underground storage. Delfo decided to chime in as he eyed Adalia. He despised the Federation, and I knew that meant he hated her too. I can speak for myself, Delfo. I rolled my eyes. This? This is the human. She evidently knows too much. You told us she had no idea what was happening, and it was an innocent mistake. But now she is here. She has seen us and is now a threat. We have to eliminate her. Hecane stared at Adalia before turning to the rest of us. She has to go. The others began to nod their head and agree. No, that is not who we are. That is not what we do. We do not kill innocent people. I ran and stood in front of the captain, who had discreetly picked up her weapon in all the commotion. She's right. It's not what your people do. But it would make things a hell of a lot easier if you did. That's for damn sure. Delfo annoyingly pointed out. This was a mistake, Adalia finally said, bringing everyone's attention back to her. I watched as even those getting medical attention or waiting for rations were engrossed in the scene playing out in front of them. I'm actually on my way back to Uva Station and getting the hell off this rock. You people can continue doing whatever it is you are doing. Helping the sick. Also, question, why are they not in standard medical facilities? Hecane raised his gun to her face. That's not your concern. She shook her head. You're right. Before a compromise could start, a white blast scorched past my face and a plasma round disappeared into Hecane's arm. I watched as he flopped to the floor in slow motion. Then everything went haywire. Hot plasma bullets were coming from every angle. Adalia and Delfo each grabbed an arm and pulled me to the ground. You did this, he spat at the captain. What? Of course I didn't. I thought you two were smuggling weapons, she said reaching behind her back where she had stowed her gun earlier. I looked at her in disbelief. I told you last night that I wasn't a smuggler, I said, with a hint of hurt in my voice. Well, I don't really know you do, I, Zima. Now, I think you are possibly part of a rogue terror group that gives medical assistance, which is very confusing. What? 
I am not a terrorist. Ladies, ladies, can we discuss this later? How about we get out of this alive? Delpho said, wholly aggravated. He raised his eyebrows and motioned for us to follow him. We remained crouched on the ground and began following him to the rear of the building. A blast disoriented us briefly as more bucklers arrived with high-pressure plasma assault rifles. We had to get out of here. I yelled at as many people as I could to follow us in the chaos, but it was a madhouse. A high-ranking buckler walked in and scoped the scene through his black-tinted helmet. A mechanical voice emanated from him, kill them all. Within seconds, the barrage of plasma rounds moved from targeting freedom defenders to the poor, vulnerable people in the warehouse. No, I do not know how it happened, but I stood and ran toward the bucklers. I froze only when a firearm was pointed in my face, and I knew in my mind this was it. At least I went out fighting for what I believed in. In an instant, Adalia was by my side. She grabbed my hand, pulled me back, and took my place in one quick move. She raised her arm and fired her weapon. It was deafening and bright as the white-hot plasma round smouldered and hit its target between the buckler's eyes. Now move, she commanded me, and I promptly followed. Delpho stood in the alley behind the warehouse. The sounds of gunfire and shouts rang on behind us. My entire unit and the warehouse were lost. We kept to the back streets until I recognised where we were headed. Delphos. He had done very well for himself in Aros and lived on the flush side of the city with all the upscale citizens. He smuggled for everyone, even government officials. We took the elevator to the 54th floor, where Delpho lived in one of the most expensive high-rise lofts in the city. We rushed in as he opened the door and dropped where we stood. We sat in silence for a while, until Delpho asked if we were thirsty and left to get beverages without waiting for a reply. Adalia and I stared at each other. I was not sure what to say to her. I felt responsible for dragging her into this mess, and now she had killed someone protecting me. What do you even say to someone who kills the person trying to kill you? Somehow thank you just did not seem like enough. Chapter 6. Adalia. Look, I appreciate you having my back out there and letting us hide out in your place. But I don't trust you. Given a chance... I will turn you in for your crimes against the Federation. I told Delpho as he brought us some water. Yeah, yeah, I get it. We are enemies. He rolled his eyes and went to the only window in his place. It was massive and delivered an incredible aerial view of the city below. He stared for a while before anyone spoke again. Zima broke the silence. We should probably turn on the news feeds. Delpho shook his head and double-tapped his window, activating his view screen, and he instructed, Play updated news feed. There was another terrorist attack today by the so-called Freedom Defense. The overly calm voice announced, We are all free on Vivonu, so their name in itself makes it more confusing for the government to know what their demands are. The terror group, headquartered in the southern continents, bombed an old warehouse on the west side of Aros, the building was being used to house overflow patients from the medical facilities. I gasped as clips of the building I was just in showed it wholly decimated. There were no survivors, although bucklers at the scene advised that many of the resistance group did flee. Communications Officer Londil has approved a citywide communications blackout until these criminals are brought to justice. Zima began to cry and Delpho walked over and patted her shoulder. What the Franks is going on? I was shocked and disgusted when the bucklers busted in and started shooting. But I assumed they had been there for the smugglers and were unaware of the civilians in the building. Seeing that they destroyed the building and the people living there, I knew differently. I stared at Zima, but she was overwhelmed with emotion and unable to speak. 
Glancing at Delpho expectingly, he sighed, sat next to Zima, and gestured for me to sit back down as well. The government of Vivanu is comprised of very wealthy and powerful citizens. It has been this way for centuries. When the Irus Federation approached them, they saw a way to be even more powerful. The Federation has rules, though. Vivonu had to deal with its poverty issue. To be accepted, the government had to devise a long-term plan to end poverty. Once this plan was in place and the Federation saw some action, they would accept Vivonu and continue helping them make this process a success, Delpho explained, still patting Zima's shoulder. I shook my head. Yes, this sounds reasonable. It's a standard procedure put into place to induct new planets. The same applies to any human settlements that decide they want to join as well. Well, the Vivanusians were impatient. While they reported to the Federation that they had put a new strategy into action that would eliminate poverty planet-wide, sadly, in reality, they started quietly eliminating their poorest citizens. I had been helping the Freedom Defense for a while, working to deter citizens from wanting to join the Federation in hopes of swaying the government's decision as well. I glanced at Zima, still softly crying behind her golden locks. I couldn't fathom that she was part of a resistance group. So, you are both members of this freedom defense? Yes, Zima said between sniffles. But you must understand, we held rallies and had charity events to raise awareness of what joining the Federation would be. The media has painted us as a terror group to support the government's claims. This was becoming a lot for me to take in. But your people had guns, Zima. To defend ourselves and the people in the abandoned warehouse. Exactly, Delpho chimed in. We had to adapt, Captain. To protect innocent lives, we had to adapt. I didn't think I could feel such a wave of hot, burning anger that came from realizing what Zima and Delpho had been telling me. What this government was doing was inconceivable and went against everything the Federation stood for. I was about to activate my comms when I remembered the citywide communication blackout. I needed to let my command know what was happening and get off this rock. The Titan! I yelled out of the blue, making Zima jump. Sorry, but comms won't be blocked on the Titan. I can reach someone from the Federation there. We have to get to the station. That seemed to perk her up a bit. A tiny spark of hope was what she needed right now. Delpho jumped up and started pacing while seemingly deep in thought. The large window behind him let in the light of the beautiful city I had admired last night. The sky was a wondrous hue of pinks and blues as the sun would be setting soon. It will be dark soon, I offered. We should be on our way. It's not safe for me to be seen with you, Adalia. After that news feed, it would be suspicious for you to be seen with someone from the southern continents. She's right, Delpho agreed, still pacing. Well, we can't just leave her alone, I said to Delpho, avoiding eye contact with Zima. We won't, he said calmly. She will take the tunnels under the city. Alone? It slipped before I could even think about it, but I could not help but be concerned for her safety. I'll be fine. I used to live there not too long ago. Besides, the defense uses the tunnels as well. It will give me a chance to check on my friends. I will meet you both there. She said, standing. Wait, why can't we all use the tunnels and go together? You are a high-priority guest, Captain. A visitor from the Federation. It will be reported as soon as you enter the station. We need them to think that everything is normal and you do not know the extent of what is happening here for your safety. I'm sure they are probably already looking for you. I nodded at Delpho. That makes sense. Zima smiled and grabbed my hand. Adalia, I will be fine, and see you soon. I smiled back at her as she began to walk to the door. Zima paused momentarily, then hurriedly turned towards me and hugged me. Thanks for saving my life, Captain Adalia Shang of the Federation. She pulled my face towards her and kissed me. It was unexpected, and I barely knew her, but it felt like I had been waiting for this kiss my entire life. I could have spent eternity happily in her embrace, and that kiss was just the spark of the sweetness of passions and emotions to come. But for now, I had to watch her walk out the door and into the unknown. Chapter 7 
Adalia. After Delpho ransacked his loft, filling a backpack with supplies he said would be vital if he couldn't return home, we made our way to Uva Station with no issues. There were at least six bucklers when we reached the entrance versus the usual two I had come to expect. Usually they were unarmed, but today they stood proudly holding weapons as if they had a shiny new toy. They politely nodded and gave us no issue entering the station. Honestly, their security sucked. We should have both been scanned before entering, considering the so-called terror threat they were dealing with. Once in the lift, Delpho cleared his throat before cautiously turning towards me. I waited for what I assumed would be an awkward conversation, but he kept hesitating like he was going back and forth in his mind on whether he should speak or not. When the doors opened, I hurriedly walked out, trying to get to the Titan as quickly as possible. Delpho, on the other hand, stayed behind. I looked back at him. Oh, just spit it out, would you? I finally said, exasperated. I mean, isn't it obvious? Are you going to hold me in your ship and turn me over to the Federation? He leaned against the wall cheekily. I was in a tough spot. I had needed his help, and he had protected me and Zima. Now I was going back and forth in my mind deciding what to do. I took an oath as an officer to protect the boundaries of the Eris Federation from all enemies. Can we discuss this later? We just witnessed mass murder. I'm sure this can wait. Nah, fuck that. I am not walking into a trap. I know what the Federation is offering for me, and I'm not going down like that. I want to help you. Zima trusts you, so I will too, but I will die before I go to prison. Fine, whatever. I won't turn you in. Can we go now? The words left my body fighting against every ounce of willpower I had. I was Federation through and through, just like my father and his father before him. To rub it in even more, Delpho clapped his hands and did a little jump before walking towards me and putting his hand out. Let's shake on it. What, now? Yes. Your father is from Earth. I know you know that you are giving me your word if we shake on it. If I could have, I would have reached into my ankle holster, pulled out my standard issue, aimed, and let someone clean up the mess of Delpho Unis left all over this docking bay. But Zima was on her way and for some reason, he was her friend. I decided she would never forgive me for killing Delpho, and I would be pissed to have bits and pieces of Delpho on my G-boots. Instead, I smiled and shook his damn hand. Can we go now? I said through gritted teeth. And after this is done, you will tell me how you knew my father was from Earth. This is your ship? This is what the Federation has their officers gallivanting across the galaxy in? Delpho looked at the Titan with disdain. I rolled my eyes, opened the cargo bay door, and shoved him in. Come on. I'm just saying, Captain, you deserve better. Ignoring Delpho as he eyed the tiny cabin and put his hand over his mouth to stifle his laughter, I headed straight for the nav system on the central console. Cap, come on, Cap, this is sad. Do you have bunk beds? What kind of captain are you? <laughs> I looked at him over my shoulder while I brought the ship online to access comms deciding that I should have shot him. 5 Alpha 689 reporting, please respond. I watched the console waiting for a response. Delpho walked and stood beside me while we waited for someone light years away to say something. I decided to try again. 5 Alpha 689 reporting, please respond. You know, Delpho began as he kneeled beside me and rested his head on his hand like a curious child. I think you and Zima make a lovely couple. Do you fancy her? I stared at him incredulously. Command code 9952, Echo 34. Captain Xiang, what is your status? Came a woman's voice through the comms. Command, I'm still on Vivonu. I have not been cleared to leave yet. I will reach out to the Vivanusian government and have you cleared within the hour. All went well with the delivery, Captain? Delpho and I eyed each other. He raised his eyebrows and mouthed, Tell them. Command, I have witnessed the Vivanusians murder innocent citizens. They have not worked out a plan to help uplift their people out of poverty. They are executing them. Something must be done quickly to provide aid to these people. Possibly grant them asylum. This goes against everything the Eros Federation stands for. 
we waited for a response. Captain Xiang. The voice that now spoke was a male's voice. A voice I knew. Admiral Andre Luca, my commanding officer. Admiral Luca, what a surprise to hear from you, sir. I was reporting what I found. Captain, we are aware that the Vivanusian government isn't doing things precisely how we would have liked, but we do not want to meddle in their affairs. You understand, Captain? I was speechless. Indeed, I wasn't hearing the Admiral correctly. Sir, I'm sorry. I must not understand. You know what is happening here? How? We have people in place monitoring the situation closely. Storm and thunder, Delpho began pacing. We will allow the Vivanusian government to handle their issues as they see fit until they join the Federation. At that time, we will ensure they follow protocols according to our standards. Captain, we need a foothold in the Oobale system. Vivonu is our way in. You remain on the Titan, and we will have you cleared within the hour. Copy? This was not happening. A battle was happening in my mind, and I wasn't sure which side would win. The Federation was everything to me, to my family for generations, but this was wrong. Captain, do you copy? Admiral Luca's voice cut through the fog of tension in the tiny ship. Copy that, Admiral. Chapter 8. Zima. This was not happening, I thought to myself as I continued up the ladder that led to the maintenance hatch to the air duct of the berthing floor of the station. I was exhausted and probably running on adrenaline at this point. My hands were shaking, and I just wanted to give up. I waited in the arranged meeting spot just like we had practiced. I had broken protocol and waited 45 minutes instead of 30 but I had hope. I just knew someone was going to show up, but no one did. My heart broke with every step I took away from that spot. I tried forcing myself to think positively. Maybe someone showed up at the rendezvous spot right before I arrived. Perhaps they too were on their way to the station. Hakane had been paying bucklers for extended docking for months for a quick escape if needed. We had no comms or way to reach each other, so I hoped for the best and envisioned everyone waiting on the ship for me. Opening the hatch, my hands were still shaking. I had no weapons, no comms, and I didn't know what awaited me. The soft hum of the air filtration system was the only thing I heard. I continued exiting the maintenance hatch and closed it as quietly as possible. I breathed a sigh of relief, looking around and seeing no one. Adalia and Delpho would be at Docking Bay 35, but a cane's ship was the opposite way at 73. I started walking, looking behind me every few steps, to Docking Bay 73. I had to let my people know I was okay. I needed to see them and know they were okay as well. I ducked between two mini transport pods when I heard someone close a metal hatch. Mini pods were equipped for one person, so I was lying on the ground, trying to hide between these tiny ships. I watched as two sets of feet disappeared into a waiting vessel a few spots away. Carefully getting up, I decided to pick up the pace as much as possible without drawing attention to myself. There sitting placidly was Hecken's ship, aptly named the Sholen or Liberty in the language of his tribe. It was a modest spacecraft effectively devoid of colour, intended to ward off any attention and give the assumption it was just a tiny cargo freighter passing through. I entered the code for the loading hatch, and the metal ramp clinked and clanked as it descended. Rushing in and hitting the button for the loading hatch to close, I had no time to waste. I quickly made my way to the flight deck, hoping to run into anyone on the way there. No such luck, and I was devastated when I reached the flight deck and was met with darkness and dead silence. I had lied to Adalia and knew nothing about ships, 
but could bring the Sholen online without thrusters. It worked. She would fly when we needed her. Pretty much running all the way to the Titan, I still looked over my shoulder quite often, but I was becoming desperate. The Titan was closed up and looked idling, which was a good sign. Waving dramatically in front of the rear-facing cameras, I almost squealed with joy when the cargo bay door opened. I fled inside as the door closed behind me and did not stop until I was face to face with Adalia. I automatically hugged her and felt lighter when she hugged me back. But she was noticeably upset. What's wrong? I looked at her and then to Delpho. Were you unable to reach the Federation? Oh, we reached them all right. Delpho retorted as he plopped down on the bottom bunk in the corner. They don't care, Zima. Typical Federation bullshit. What? Adalia, what's going on? I turned back to her with tears welling in my eyes. She looked down, ashamed. He's right. They know what is going on here and have ordered me home. I'll probably be cleared to leave any minute now. I had never liked the Federation. After human colonists wandered into our system, the Federation had been trying to infiltrate in any way they could. I had put my trust in Adalia, though. Although she was Federation, she was genuine and had a good heart. I saw the hurt and disgust in her eyes when the bucklers began shooting innocent people back at the warehouse. She looked just as broken as I felt. We both looked as the view screen flashed, showing someone in the rear view camera. My excitement took over as recognition settled in that it was her cane. Delpho was faster than me and was already on his way to the cargo bay while Adalia released the door. We ran to join them right as Delpho was helping Hecane up the ramp. He slumped down and leaned against the cold, metallic wall. His light pink skin and parts of his clothes were stained crimson. I stooped next to him. Hecane, where is everyone else? He put his hand up to stop me. His voice was strained, and it seemed like every breath was a struggle for him. There is no time. They slaughtered us, Zima. We must leave. Now. They are on their way. We have a small window for clearance in the Sholen from my brother in the transport department. But we need to go now. Adalia's ship will be cleared soon. We can remain on board, and she can drop us off somewhere. I glanced at Adalia, who shook her head. No. He groaned as he grabbed Delpho's extended hand, trying to stand. I messed up. After the attack on the warehouse, I assumed your human was involved. I reported her as conspiring with us. They won't let her leave without questioning now. Chapter 9. Adalia You what? I asked, almost yelling. I didn't even notice how close I had gotten to Hekine, until Zima put her hand on my chest, stopping me from advancing further. It was enough that I was at odds with my own government, but now a foreign government would be seeking me for questioning, for being involved in what they considered a terrorist group. I'm sorry, he grunted. You can punch me later. Right now, we have to go. He was right, of course. The Titan would not be leaving any time soon. I raced to the cabin, grabbed my bag, and strapped it across my body. I slipped on my glasses and checked the console cameras on all sides. It was all clear for the time being. I unholstered my weapon and went back to the cargo bay. How far away is your ship, Hakane? Docking Bay 73, Zima interjected. As much as I hated admitting it, it was a good plan. We deboarded the Titan quietly, like a covert special ops team that had been working together for years. I made sure to set the pace quickly enough to get to our destination, but still, considering that Hekayin was weak and a bit slower than average. 
There were a few idling ships in the station today, and there seemed to be more foot traffic than I had ever noticed. But we continued forward, weapons at the ready, just not openly showing. Delfo and I heard it simultaneously and looked at each other with raised brows. Boots. Military grade G. Boots clanked against the metallic floors of the berthing area. There had to be at least twenty. I rushed Zima and Hecane to the side of a massive freighter. It was sleek, and its black reflective outer layer was cool to the touch. Delfo peered around the corner, looking toward the advancing bucklers. He looked back at me, shaking his head. They aren't coming this way. It looks like they are going to the Titan. We were almost there, ducked in between docking bays, 66 and 67. We would have to make a dash for it. I thought about Hecane when he sighed heavily and shifted his weight from leaning on Zima to the freighter. He would undoubtedly slow us down, but I had never left a man behind and wasn't about to start now. Have they surrounded the Titan? I asked, checking the remaining rounds in my 5-8 DT. Delfo peeked again and shook his head no. Then we go. Before we moved, the ground shook, and a white flash forced us to cover our eyes. I pushed Delfo back, needing to see what was happening. Slowly looking over the thrusters of the freighter, I glanced around to get a glimpse. The bucklers had blown up the Titan and then set up some kind of vacuum seal around it, keeping the blast contained within it. They hadn't even asked for the evacuation of my ship. They probably assumed I was on board, as there was no evidence of me leaving Uva Station since I had arrived earlier with Delfo. They are occupied. We go now, I said, helping Hekayan stand. He and Zima went first this time, and I followed closely behind. Delfo waited a few seconds before following as well. I refused to let my guard down until I was out of the shooting range of this damn planet. The Sholin came into view. It was a nice-sized craft, about a hundred meters or so, and painted in a muted color, making it very inconspicuous. It was perfect for our little group until we figured out what our next step would be. We had remained unnoticed until Zima entered the boarding ramp code, and it clattered when it made contact with the metal flooring. Bring systems online and get us flight ready now, I advised her, while she gripped Haykane, trying to get him up the ramp. Hey there, do you have identification or docking slips? A buckler called out. This brought on all the attention we had been trying to avoid, and a group of bucklers was now approaching us. I pushed Zima and Hakane, helping them up the ramp, but not quickly enough, as one of the bucklers recognized the towering salmon-colored alien. Stop! Hakane Tisa! Halt! Captain, can you fly this thing? Delfo called, gun raised and eyes trained on the advancing bucklers. Yes, but I'm not leaving you. I yelled back as the thrusters came online. Its rumbles and heat filled the air. Get us in the air, Cap. Just close the ramp at the very last minute, you hear? Delfo started towards the bucklers and started shooting. I bolted up the ramp and straight to the flight deck. Zima was in the co-pilot chair, nervously checking the view screens, trying to figure out what was happening. Where is Hakane? I asked her, not looking up from the console and sitting in the pilot's chair. After I got everything online, I helped him to one of the bunks. He's resting. I checked and double-checked that all systems were a go and prepared the acceleration sequence. Just then, a loud beeping noise sounded, and Zima pulled what looked like a wrist HUD extension from her pocket. It's Hecane's. He said it was on a timer from his brother's instructions. The thrust locks will be turned off for the Sholin, and that's when we should go. She strapped in. Wait, what about Delfo? I didn't answer. This was our only shot. The thrust locks had been disabled, just like Hakane's brother said. I started the takeoff sequence, and we began to accelerate. I hit comms. Hold tight, everyone. A red light started flashing, indicating the ramp was still down. I checked the exterior camera displays but saw no sign of Delfo. The red light stopped blinking, and I heard Delfo yelling in the distance. Whew! Took out four of them! Get us out to here, Cap! Delfo yelled hustling to a passenger pod right off the fleet deck side. I blasted away from the docking station, expecting a ship or two to be in close pursuit. I spun and zigzagged when I could, just in case we were being followed, then accelerated to full speed and steadied the Sholin only to make it through the planet's atmosphere. Can they track us? Zima asked, no one in particular, her charcoal eyes glued to the sight before her. She stared into the starry vault of space, and I remembered that she had never been off-planet before. 
Nah, Delpho responded. The Sholin was my special project. No one can track us, and I can change the ship's identity chip to broadcast what we want when needed. We are home free. But that was my home, Sima said softly, her voice cracking slightly. Where are we going? Will we be safe, Adalia? I grabbed her hand and smiled, even though I didn't know where we were headed or how I would deal with the Federation. I don't know where we are going yet, but we'll be together. We will all keep each other safe. It pains me to say it, but we made a good team. Honestly, I pretty much carried the team, Delpho said, standing behind us. I rolled my eyes, and Zima laughed. <laughs>